History is a vast and changing narrative, and if we were to explore the whole of history, we'd be able to get lost in different elements. But by studying a local area and looking at its local and national importance, we're able to uncover a whole story. And this is the story of Plymouth Barbican. If you look around me today, we can see that actually tourism is thriving, we've got shops, we've got restaurants that all allow for this economy to develop. However, we're going to delve into its past and find out some of the missing parts of history and some of the well-known parts of history and how Plymouth has evolved and shaped these over time. So the importance of areas such as Plymouth and Plymouth Barbican, particularly those of coastal towns, can be seen very much in the military sense because of their importance in trying to protect the local area. Um, a key kind of physical remain that may show this story is the castle which was built on Lamhay Hill. This is what remains of the castle. It was destroyed as a result of the citadel being built in the 1600s. It was originally built in the 1400s and was completed in 1416 and was funded by the tax that was placed on Hake. Um, if we look now, you can actually see that it lacks any historical value or importance to people who don't know about this physical remain. You can see that there are flats built behind and there's a little garden inside. The importance of Plymouth Barbican can be reinforced by the fact that Edward the Black Prince, the Prince of Wales, so the person in line to the throne, Edward III's son, um, was stationed here in Plymouth during the Hundred Years' War, which was with the French. What we can actually see was um, the importance of the area, mainly because you can see very far out into the distance, and we could see the French attacking forces before they even made their way in. And a key example of an attacking force would be the 1403 raid, which resulted in 1,200 Frenchmen entering kind of Plymouth. Obviously, at this point, the castle had not been completed. They then went along Exeter Street and they raided some near th uh, 600 houses and as a result those 600 houses were destroyed. So we can see the devastating impact of the Hundred Years War on this part of, kind of the world. So it's showing us the national importance for this area and also shows us the importance of why the castle was built. It seems a shame for us as historians the reason why that this kind of building was destroyed because actually now that part of history is gone. What we can see is out into the water and we can see the natural harbour which actually allowed for people to settle here in the first place and we can see the gentle hills and the south facing slopes which allowed for those people to settle. So when writing your exam questions and when writing about this sort of castle and the physical remains we just mention the fact that this one tower and wall remains. Here we are at the Citadel, it is the largest building on the Barbican. As I'm stood next to it, you can see the scale of this building and it seems impenetrable, particularly from the outside. Um, we are filming it from this location because at the moment it is still a military base. So as a result, it is going to be almost impossible for us to be able to film inside. It was built during the Civil War, so the English Civil War, and was completed in 1675 after Charles II was restored to power. Its role and its function within the Barbican is to make sure it's protected. But Cosmo de Dimitri III stated that he thought that the citadel was built in 1669 because actually of what Plymouth had done to the monarchy in the time of the English Civil War and serves as a reminder to the English people and to Plymouth in particular not to stand against your king because actually during the English Civil War they were fighting against the king and they had gone against him. So we can see that that kind of message is still strong with the way in which it's so overpowering and it dominates the Barbican and it's where the edge of the Barbican is today. So something of particular national importance and something that links us very much to kind of world communities is the Mayflower. And this is something that commemorates one very famous short voyage, but at the time it was not seen as something that was particularly important. So as a result, what actually remains and what was true to the time is not quite the same. What we have here is a plaque which commemorates the Mayflower setting sail, which was actually laid in 1891 once they realised the importance of the Mayflower and its connections to America, which you can see by the two flags above me. So when we're looking at this, this has all been created really to aid the tourism in the area and it wasn't commemorated at the time because actually the people who left from the Mayflower and left towards America were not people of particular importance to Britain 
They were seen as outcasts, people that weren't conforming to the religious accepted theology and ideas. These were people who were known as Puritans and they became what were known as the Pilgrims, but this was actually something that was not seen as important at the time. So the original steps, we don't actually know where they were located. Different theories hold that it might be in the pub above, behind me. Others say that actually it potentially could be anywhere else. This has just been created so that when we see tourists in the local area, they have somewhere to go to celebrate and remember the Mayflower setting sail in 1620. Welcome to the older street in Plymouth. This is New Street. And you can see behind me there are some major works going to renovate and to restore some of the older buildings. So a key reason why number 32 New Street is so significant for us when we're looking at the history of the Tudor Barbican is because the building of the street was financed by the privateer come property developer John Spark who was known for sailing with John Hawkins and he had writings about the tomato and the potato so a key kind of historical figure that we can look at. Now this street, New Street, was a prosperous street so it was very wealthy and it had many celebrated and wealthy families that lived there and number 32 is the one building that does remain. It was constructed in 1584 and it's really important for us to look at because it tells us a great deal about the Tudor history and Tudor past. It retains many of its original features and its structure and layout are largely unaltered. It has seven rooms on three different floors. It has white lime washed plaster walls and bare wooden floors and oak beams, which may have been salvaged from a ship and a central new post, which was once a ship's mast. The house was built with local materials, um, including limestone, slate and oak, and the furniture contained within it reflects the original functions of the different floors. So on the first floor, we'd see the working and the cooking on the ground floor. So on that bottom floor where we're looking at, we can see that that would have been where many of the jobs would have been completed. On the second floor um, would have been the entertaining and the dining, and that would be where a lot of people would show off their wealth and their class. And then on the top floor is the more private areas. This would be your bedrooms, the sleeping and the privacy would be contained within the top floor. And this was pretty typical of the Tudor period. Um, with their buildings and we can see there's a large amount of glass in the front. This is due to the fact that they wanted to show off their wealth and the fact that they had the money to be able to afford the glass that you can see there. So if we continue up from number 32 New Street, which is the Elizabethan house, we can begin to see another thing which has been remade to make sure it kind of refers back to its Tudor ancestral history. And that is the Elizabethan gardens, which if you're looking at here, you can see that these houses look very much like people's normally normal homes and normal businesses. But if we go through this archway, we will be able to see the Elizabethan gardens. We are quite lucky to be studying the Barbican because actually when we're looking at the damage that was accrued during the Second World War, the Barbican was largely undamaged whereas Plymouth City Centre had heavy bombing. So as a result, the Barbican kind of remained untouched. Therefore, when we're looking at the Barbican and the area around there, the buildings kind of were just restored and particularly those with a focus on the older buildings, those with ancient lineage. And the key reason why this was being done is because of the Plymouth Barbican Association, which was created in 1957. And this focused on retaining and the heritage of the area, so trying to maintain it. And by 1967, the Barbican district was actually known as a conservation area. And Elizabethan Gardens grew from that. So between 1969 and 1970, the Barbican Association created these gardens out of the derelict ruins of the cottages to mark the 350th anniversary of the Mayflower setting sail from Sutton Harbour. So this area was created to look older and they were using old remains, but actually we lack the evidence that this actually existed in the Tudor era, which can pose a potential problem for us as historians looking at this site. Okay, so here we have the oldest building in the Barbican. It was created in 1383 and it was originally a religious building. Obviously, its use has changed 
quite considerably since then. Um, so in 1383 it was housing and housed the Blackfriars monks which were a group of religious monks who lived in the Barbican and where we're standing here would have been roughly where we think the water would have been coming up to. So actually the Barbican shape has changed a significant amount and the land that we're standing on is called the New Quay and this was built due to the prosperity that came about in the Tudor period because of the wealth that was being brought into the Barbican due to the fish that was found in Newfoundland and due to the explorers and merchants and, and traders that all came from Afarbican, this area grew and as a result they needed more land to trade on. And this is where we see today, where Southside Street is, and onwards that way, you'd see the area which was kind of new key and where it was built. If we look back at this building, you can see some of the features and some of the original areas so you can see original doorways and when we look at the gym bottles we can see the little monk at the bottom which kind of gives a little nod to its history about the fact that it was orig originally a religious place. However, after um, the break of Rome in the 1530s with Henry VIII, this building changed its use once and it changed it to a debtor's prison. So it would have housed the people who owed money to various people within the Barbican and its third use was it was bought in 1793 by the Coates family and this was to be able to create gin. The building that you can see here is the fish market. Now its use, like many of the other buildings, has changed over time. Fishing has been integral to the Plymouth Barbican since its creation and it's evolved and in the industrial era and um, the fishing industry still remained quite important to the area. During the Industrial Revolution and in 1896 this fish market was built. It was designed by James Inglis who was an engineer to Great Western Railway and you can see from the building it's got the lower canopy has a continuous fretted valance which is the railway station type which you can see there at the top and this still kind of can be present and as you're looking at it you can see that history and that design. Its use has changed so as you can see it's now a restaurant and cafe and shop so it's no longer that fishing importance but it's still important for the tourism in the area.